So here's a passage of scripture that can very well land you in jail someday for proclaiming it in public places or even sharing it or even referring to it. In the future, this is going to be a illegal passage of scripture. It's going to be considered hate speech, and we need to push against that as hard as we can. So while I can share it, I'm going to share it, and when I can't share it, I'm going to share it. So it is in Romans chapter 1, verse, we're going to start with verse 16. If the apostle Paul is saying, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, and we should never be ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. So what God wants to do is save all of humanity, regardless of our sins. God loves us and God desires to save our soul. So salvation is by faith in Jesus Christ. I believe the reason that's so is because Adam and Eve chose to believe the lie of the devil over the truth of God's word. And God says, let's reverse that. If you want to be saved, you put your faith in Jesus Christ, the one I sent to die on the cross to save your soul. And so that's how you're saved is putting your faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So we jump down in verse um, uh, verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. And so he's saying, God is saying, I have given you all the evidence you need to believe in Jesus Christ, and yet you have continued to reject me. And so you suppress the truth. This is a word for the atheist, the agnostic, and all those who just push God out of their life. And he's saying, why would you do that when the evidence is so clear? You can see God everywhere. Somebody says, give me proof that there is a God. I'm talking, how foolish can you be to even ask for proof for God when everything we see, God created? So why would we suppress that truth when we look at the order and the fine-tuning of our universe, and we understand the moral values that we have that God put in us. And there's so much evidence out there, and he's saying the wrath of God is going to be poured out on those who reject God's obvious truth, and they do it in unrighteousness. And then he says this. Here's why, verse 19, because what may be known of God is made known in them, for God has shown it to them. So he said, look, it's not that you have a lack of uh, evidence and you can't believe. It's that you have a lack of respect for God and his uh, morals, his values, his direction. And so you suppress God so that you could chase after your sexual sin and all your ungodly ways, your pride, your greed, and all the arrogance and you suppress God and not giving any thought to the wrath of God. God has provided all that he's provided for us, and we reject him. And so he goes on, he says, For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. So they are without excuse. And so when you say, oh, I just didn't see the evidence, you're lying. God has shown you the evidence, and he's shown the evidence to everybody all over the world, all throughout uh, history, God has shown evidence of the fact that he exists. And yet some people choose to chase after God and say, my God, how can I be pleasing in your sight? And we turn to him by faith and accept God's sacrifice for our soul, the Lord Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for us. And we accept him and he saves us. But other people say, don't bother me, God. I want to, I want to feel the passions that I have and I want to be free to do whatever I want to do. And they chase after their sin in absolute rebellion to God. And that's a problem. He says, you're without an excuse. Verse 21, because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were they thankful, but became vain in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. In other words, they, they, they thought about the vain stuff, the stuff that has no real value, the stuff here on this earth, the here and now. Instead of thinking of the almighty God who created us, who's loved us, who's given us this wonderful place to live, a wonderful life, and then we turn our back on it and we rebel against God. The wrath of God is coming on us and, and justly so it should. And so in verse 22, he says, professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man. In other words, your God's too small. You have allowed God to be shrunk down to the size of your little brain. 
Verse 24, listen to the warning. He says, Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanliness, to the lust of their own heart, to dishonor their own bodies among themselves. And so he says in verse 24, God gave them up. You know what it means? When a person denounces God, when a person rejects God over and over again, the Holy Spirit of God speaks to the heart, shows that He is who He is, and they continue to turn their back on God. And they continue to reject Him to say, I don't believe Him or I don't want to follow Him. I'm not living for Him. And they keep doing it. The Bible says God also gave them up to uncleanliness. In other words, God backed off. God said, look, look I mean, think about this. The Almighty God speaks to us, and we say, I don't want to talk to you. What an insult is that? What an insult. And so God says, fine. Look, dude, you don't want to talk to me. You ain't going to get to talk to me. I will leave you alone. Your God loves you. He wants the best for you. And yet you're thumbing your nose at God. You're saying, I don't need you. Get out of my way. I want to chase after my sin. I want to do what I want to do. I don't want God in my life. And because of that, that brings down the wrath of God on you. That's what the Bible's talking about. In verse 26, for this reason, God gave them up. Second time, he said it. First in verse 24, he says, God also gave them up to uncleanliness. In verse 26, for this reason, God gave them up to vile passions. And then he lists these passions. And this is the part that it will land you in jail, if not now, certainly in the future. They'll call it hate speech because it's, it's directly speaking to the sexual perversion of this world. And he's absolutely directly speaking to homosexuality. Watch what he says. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions for even their women exchange the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise also, men leaving the natural use of a woman, burned in their lust, one for another, men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error which was due. He is absolutely, very clearly denouncing homosexuality as a horrible sin that happens whenever people reject the way of God and they chase after their own vile passions. And I want to say something here. There are those who believe if you're homosexual, you immediately, that's a ticket to hell. I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is, whenever you reject God and His way, that's a direct ticket to hell, whether it's homosexual, heterosexual, or, or whatever. The point is, God is God, and He's the one to worship. He is the Almighty, and He's the one that we should bow to. He, he should come above our personal wants, passions, and desires. God is God, and we are not. And sin is against God. And when God's Spirit speaks to us, and we reject Him and say, I don't want nothing to do with Him. Don't be surprised when God says, then you won't have nothing to do with me, but I'm going to pour my judgment out on you. So there may be somebody listening to this that you're already in the homosexual lifestyle. That's not the unpardonable sin. Do you know what the unpardonable sin is? The unpardonable sin is God sent his son to save your soul and you reject him. Whether you're homosexual or heterosexual, whatever, it doesn't matter. Anybody who does not accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior has committed the unpardonable sin. It means, so God, he knocks at our heart's door. He, he speaks to us. He draws us. He, he, he wants us to be saved. And, and it's not his desire that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so God is wooing us all, calling us all. Anybody that wants to be saved, giving an invitation and then we keep saying, no, God, leave me alone. Then that's an unpardonable sin. After a while, God says, okay, I'm going to leave you alone. We're done here. And the next time you hear from God, you'll be at the great white throne judgment where you will experience the wrath of God. And that's what the Bible teaches. Now, if you're homosexual and you're saying, well, I didn't realize it was such a bad thing. I, I, I grew up this way or I, I've learned this from my family or from school or wherever. I didn't realize it was such a bad thing. Then repent. Then turn to the Creator who created you. And then look in the mirror and see yourself and say, Man, God made me. And I need to turn to God and be saved. I'll tell you something. If you'll do it, He will save your soul. He'll wash your sins away. And He'll save your soul because, listen to me, God does love you. God does want to save you. 
And so if you have a desire in your heart to turn back to God, you can do it. You can't look back at your sins. Oh, I'm so terrible. I've done so many bad things. We all have. We all have. But it's the one who turns back and says, Oh, Jesus, I have sinned against you. And I pray you forgive me. And you say, I'm going to give you my life. And I'm going to follow your way. And here's how you're saved. This is it. It's not by the works, but it's by you professing him to be the savior of your soul. You realize that Jesus died on the cross to take the penalty for all your sins. And he was buried and he rose again. And now his spirit's knocking at your heart's door saying, come on, give your life to Jesus. And you turn to God and you say, God, you're right. I'm wrong. And I pray you'll forgive me of my sins. And I want to ask Jesus Christ be, to be my Savior and my Lord for the rest of my life. And I'm telling you, if you'll do that, he'll save your soul. He'll wash all your sins away. And you'll be clean before the Lord. He will wash your sins away and save you. It's not too late for you now. Give your life to Jesus before it's too late. But for those who it's too late, he goes on and he says this. Verse 28, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, in other words, they don't like thinking about God. They don't want to consider God. God gave them over to a debased mind. There he is, giving them over again, third time. He's given them over to a debased mind, meaning a mind that is empty of God. God says, you don't want to think about me? I ain't going to give you the chance to think about me. And he pulls away. There's a lot of folks who will watch this video that God has already pulled away from. And they're like, they're hating the video. And they hate me. And they're going to say all kinds of ungodly things in the comment. That's fine. They'll say all kinds of nasty things. Because they have a debased mind. They couldn't see God if he stood in front of them right now. There's coming a day they're going to see him. Because every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. But for them, it'll be eternally too late. But for you. Maybe you could turn to Jesus now and be saved. He says, God gives them to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality. I'll tell you one of the biggest sins in the world today is sexual immorality. It doesn't matter whether you're homosexual, heterosexual, sexual immorality is, listen, sex outside the bonds of marriage. I'm not talking about something homosexuals call marriage. That's not holy matrimony. That is just a union outside the will of God. But, but holy matrimony is when one man and one woman stands together before God and they give their life to God, but they give their life to each other and they're married in the eyes of God. It's called holy matrimony. Homosexual crowd, they can have the same-sex marriage, all that, but God doesn't recognize that. And God is the one who created marriage. He is the one who instituted marriage and he is the one who defines marriage and he defines it as one man and one woman freely and totally committed to one another for life, that's marriage. And so anything outside of that union, holy matrimony, any sexual activity outside of that union, it is sin. And God's calling, he's calling it sexual perversion. And God's calling you to repent of that and follow him. And you say, but my passions are raging. Well, that's fine. But your passions ain't nothing to the wrath of God when it comes. And it's not just a threat. It is a warning. It is an awareness. It is an understanding that God is going to pour his wrath out on all those who suppress the truth of God to chase after their passions and their ungodliness. And so you could take it as some offensive thing that I'm saying, or you could take it as a, as a guy who's saying, man, don't hurt yourself. Don't hurt yourself. Don't, don't go to that because it's going to destroy you. But realize God has a way, and it is a right way. And marriage, holy matrimony, is God's way for men and women to enjoy the wonderful pleasures of sex that God created for a man and a woman who is joined in holy matrimony before him. And so three times we see God saying that he's stepping back and he's, he's turning people over. Don't be one of those that he turns over to a debased mind, that it is a mind empty of God, a mind who has no fear of God. And you'll see that, as I said in the comments, of people just blasting me and everything I said, just absolute hatred to what I've said because they have no fear of God. And they come up with all kinds of rhetoric that they say against me. Listen to me. Don't you worry about what they say. 
You be concerned about what God says in his Bible. And you study the word and understand what God wants for your life. We, if we have any sense, we will not suppress the truth. Man, we will run to the truth and say, what are you saying, God? Because what God has to offer those who follow him, he has to offer life, eternal life, a, a joy here on this earth, an opportunity to walk with God every day. I walk with God and I enjoy his fellowship in my life, in my heart. And, and some say, oh, it's just a fairy tale. You can't tell me it's a fairy tale. Strung out on drugs and alcohol, run wild, gave my life to Jesus. He changed me overnight where I tried to change many times on my own, could not change. And he took the drugs and alcohol out of my life. He taught me how to read and write. I was 20 years old, couldn't read and write, taught me how to read by reading my Bible. He's, he's blessed my life. He sent me back to school, sent me back to college, and he's, he's allowed me to pastor churches for 40 years. You can't tell me that's a fairy tale. God did that for me. And God, he does some wonderful things for people. And if it had been the other way around that God saved my soul, but then he allowed me to go through horrible trials and tribulations and maybe even death, here's what I can tell you. It would be worth it because I have God with me and he has not left me, but he's with me. And no matter what people do in my life, what, no matter what people do to me, man, I got it made. I got it made. If they leave me alone, I'm preaching the gospel. If they, if they persecute me, I'm preaching the gospel. If they kill me, I'm, I'm there with the Lord. They can't take it away. What God has given me is so great. And that is not the things of this world, but it is his pleasure in my life. His, his blessings, his, his presence, his, his presence is so valuable. Let me tell you something. Heaven is going to be great. But heaven ain't nothing compared to being with God. It's bigger than heaven. And those who give their life to Jesus, they're with God. How long? Forever. Jesus loves you. Loves you. Gave his life in your place that you might be saved. I want to encourage you. Give your life to Jesus. Don't suppress the truth. Turn your life to Jesus. Chase after the truth. And the truth is found in the 66 books of the Bible. And you can sit down every day and read a chapter a day and you can grow closer and closer to God. I am a guy who has been transformed by the power of his spirit and by the power of his word. I want to encourage you, give your life to Jesus before it's eternally too late. Come on, y'all. Let's follow Jesus.